Up until the 19th century, horses were the easiest and cheapest way for most people to get around, other than on foot. But in the early decades of the 19th century, strange things began happening. The summer of 1815 never seemed to come. It was cold and rainy in July. Late freezes destroyed crops, which meant food was in short supply. Things were looking bad for people, and their horses. People were desperate for food, so they started eating grain, which was normally given to horses and livestock, which led to the animals starving. Few knew it at the time. After all, there was no internet or TV news, but a volcano called Mount Tambora erupted in Indonesia. This eruption spewed so much ash into the air that people around the world felt the effects of an unusually cold and gloomy summer. But even disaster can inspire art and invention. Enter Karl Dreyas, an inventor and German civil servant. Dreyas had invented many other things, like an early typewriter, a meat grinder, and a machine to record piano music on paper. The dire conditions in 1815 made him think that people needed an alternative to horse-powered transportation. He designed a machine with two wheels and satellite seat that he called Laufmaschine, or running machine in German. It looked a bit like a modern bicycle, but it didn't have any pedals. Instead, it worked like a balance bike that you might see a toddler zooming along on now. The rider would run the Lauf machine forward, raising their feet sometimes to coast for a while. It was also nicknamed the dandy horse or hobby horse, since it was meant to be a replacement for the real horse. The Lauf machine never caught on in any really big way. It was hard to ride on the dirt roads of the time, where carriages and actual horses made deep ruts and divots in the ground that could be dangerous for riders. In cities, riders took to smoother sidewalks, but went too fast for the pedestrians, and many cities banned the Lauf machine. Andreas himself didn't benefit much from the invention either. He had unpopular political views for the time, and lived his old age in poverty. More recently, though, Andreas has been honored on stamps, coins, and on a Google Doodle, which is the drawing you see when you open the Google search engine. But the idea of the two-wheeled, human-powered transportation didn't die out. By the 1860s, other inventors were hard at work trying to improve Andreas's design. We're not really sure who got it first, but two inventors came up with similar new bicycle designs around the same time. German Karl Kech and Frenchman Pierre Lallemand. Lallemand was the first to patent his invention, and the French name Velocipede became the common term for a time. The Velocipede looked a lot like the Lauf machine, with one important difference. It had pedals that attached to the axle, or center of the front wheel. So instead of running the bike along, now the rider could pedal. A little closer to what you're familiar with today. These machines made for a bumpy ride, though. In fact, they were named Bone Shakers. Part of the reason they were so bumpy was that the wheels were made out of wood with a band of steel around the inside. Rubber tires didn't come along until later. In response to this uncomfortable ride, some people opted to ride a new kind of bike called a high wheel or penny farthing. A penny was a large coin in Britain at the time and a farthing was a much smaller coin. Maybe you've seen pictures of these old fashioned bikes with one giant wheel in the front like a penny and a tiny wheel like a farthing in the back. And if you've seen pictures, you've probably wondered how on earth anyone managed to ride them. Penny farthings were hard to get on and off of because the rider sits over the big front wheel, which was often over four feet high. That's taller than an average seven-year-old. The rider had to put one foot on a small peg, lower down on the frame, then get the bicycle moving fast enough so that they could hoist a leg over the seat without the whole thing tipping over. Once the rider was off and rolling, Larger potholes or bumps in the road could send them toppling headfirst over the handlebars. So why did people ride them? First, they were fast. Like the bone shaker, the pedals on a penny farthing attach right to the axle or center of the front wheel. But the bigger front wheel meant you covered a lot more ground with every stroke of the pedals. Think about how long the outside edge of a four foot high wheel would be if you stretched it out flat. That's over 13 and a half feet. That's how far the bicycle would go with one turn of the pedal. A bigger wheel equals more distance for each turn and less work for your legs. 
Another reason some people liked penny farthings was that they offered a smoother ride than the aptly named bone shaker. The giant front wheel absorbed more of the bumps, at least until you hit a bump enough to throw you overboard. The age of the penny farthing marked the start of the bicycle's meteoric rise in popularity. Thomas Stevens became the first person to complete a cross-continental bike ride, on a, par on a penny farthing no less, from San Francisco to Boston, and he didn't stop there. He continued to ride around the entire earth by 1886. Of course, penny farthings weren't practical or safe enough for most people to ride, and bikes with a smaller front wheel didn't go very fast. Different inventors tried all kinds of things during the 1880s and 90s to make bicycles both safer and faster. Over the years, many smaller inventions helped pave the way for the machine that would make the bicycle a practical, fast vehicle for almost everyone. The breakthrough came in 1890 with the safety bicycle. The safety bicycles had a chain and gear system that sat between the wheels and under the seat, just like a modern bicycle. It had brakes that you controlled with your hands that would squeeze the wheels and allow you to stop. And it had rubber tires that were inflated with air, making for a smooth, cushy ride. Bicycling exploded in popularity in the 1890s. Madison Square Garden in New York City hosted multi-day indoor track races where riders tried to cycle as much as they could around the clock for six days. Cycling events drew thousands. At the same time, regular people were falling in love with riding. Groups formed to advocate for better streets, which would reduce bike accidents and make riding more comfortable. The better streets also paved the way, literally, for the success of another transportation innovation, the automobile, the car. Women wanted in on the craze too, but if you think about what women wore in the 1890s, dresses with long, full skirts and tight bodices, it wasn't exactly cycling attire. Skirts could get tangled in the wheels and gears and tight bodices made it hard to do any kind of exercise. Along came bloomers. These loose billowy pants, which gathered tight under the knee, allowed women to ride safety bicycles, though many people didn't approve. Some people considered it improper for a woman to wear anything other than a skirt, and some business owners even refused to serve women in bloomers. In 1894, Annie Londonderry, a Latvian immigrant to the United States and mother of three young children, became the first woman to ride around the world on a bicycle. She had an undeniable knack for getting attention and made a lot of headlines. She wore men's cycling clothes and sold photographs of herself. She gave talks, charging admission of course, detailing the fantastic adventures and harrowing dangers she faced on her journey. She even sold space for advertising messages on her bike. Professional cycling organizations cropped up to support riders and organize races. They weren't always welcoming, though. When African-American cyclist Major Taylor began winning nearly every race he entered in the 1890s, the League of American Cyclists voted to ban blacks from competing in their races. Many people in the league disagreed with this move and let Taylor race. But the ban wasn't officially repealed or taken back until 1999. Today bicycling may not be quite the craze it was in the 1890s, but it still has plenty of devotees. From the Tour de France to mountain biking to daredevil BMXers, there are a variety of bike-based sports to choose from, and bikes are actually still a popular kind of transportation around the world. In many Chinese cities, people make more than half of their trips on a bicycle, in Denmark and the Netherlands, bicycling is hugely popular as everyday transportation. Denmark's capital, Copenhagen, has more bikes than cars on the road at rush hour. Many parents in these countries even have bikes with big boxes on the front for their kids to ride in, kind of like a family minivan. But if you're like me, nothing compares to the feeling you get when tearing down the sidewalk on your bike. You feel the wind whooshing through your helmet, your legs pushing the pedals, houses rushing by, that feeling of freedom as you pedal off into adventure and possibility. We hope you enjoyed this episode about the history of bicycles. Be sure to tune in next Monday for a new episode.